Okay, if you're watching this, you're probably on YouTube, and this is something I would have uploaded there uh, for the benefit of developers. So my name is Neil Bussey. I'm the Managing Director for Duracell UK. You can see my details there on screen. Uh, you can find me on uh, probably LinkedIn is probably the best place to find me if you've got questions or um, you want to get in touch. Um, and this is a presentation on uh, Duracell Woodcrete ICF for developers. So it's a tutorial. It goes into a bit more detail than perhaps the general introduction, but it's really focused around compliance and cost savings and benefits to, um, to developers and, and people who want to use this on a commercial level. And so we try to structure the presentation around those, those aspects. So what I'll cover is the, uh, a systems overview, which is similar to the general introduction, um, just to give you a, an idea, assuming that you know nothing about the system at all uh, and where it fits and, and how it goes together. I'm an engineer by training, so it'll be a kind of black and white assessment of what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, not too much spin in there, I hope, um, just to give you some informed, um, you know, enough information to make informed choices. Uh, I'll talk about cost savings as well. I'm not going to give away sort of quotations online, and obviously this is a, a, at a point in time, but um, I can give you some comparisons and some, some real life examples of things that have been done and looked at and where, where we feel that there are savings to be made with a system like this as well as compliance. So talking about um, accreditations and being able to get a structural warranty, get it signed off by building control, get mortgages, etc., and, and cover off on all those important aspects as well. So that's that's the aim of the presentation. Um, historically, Duracell has been um, heavily involved with um, one-off builds, been award-winning over the years that it's been in the UK. Um, and you know, here's just some examples of those. Some quite unique structures that you can create. They can either be traditional looking or they can be very sort of unique and modern um, in their sort of design, such as this, for example, with curving roofs and, um, and interesting sort of architectural details to them, uh, or just high-end sort of luxury homes and, and self-build homes that people can get their hands on. So there's been a lot of interest from self-builders in the past because it's a very simple, intuitive system that can be put together um, quite simply. However, the real benefits of something like this come in with the economies of scale when you start to build multiple units with it. And we can go into that and I can explore where I think the, the, the savings and the benefits are of a system like this uh, with commercial work. And that's where we're headed now. So into multi-build schemes. Um, like I said, you can finish them however you want. And I'll talk about the finishes that can go on the outside. But this is the sort of bread and butter stuff that Duracell can be used very quickly and easily to, to create. Social housing as well um, is something that we've been involved in, townhouses and, you know, with all sorts of finishes on the outside that could look like anything you want them to look like to fit in with the, the architecture of the region that you, you happen to be building in. Um, we've done school developments and, and um, educational work. So this was during lockdown. Like I said, I'm recording this in uh, April 2021, uh, but this was during the lockdown last year over in uh, Canterbury on a grammar school uh, there. So it's an electric theatre that was constructed onto an existing um, existing building. And you can see inside there, they were going to leave some of this exposed, I believe. Uh, I can talk about the acoustic properties of Duracell in a minute, uh, but something like this would be... Uh, um, as opposed to, to forming a, a um, an in-situ poured concrete frame, uh, you can do it with uh, with the Duracell system. Same with, um, with, with commercial and retail and um, industrial units. Uh, this is for Kia in South Wales, and uh, these went up in sort of some pretty atrocious weather conditions uh, and ended up with a kind of modern uh, contemporary um, in industrial commercial units such as such as these. So it's a pretty flexible system. We've been involved in passive house structures in the past as well. So we were involved, if you go on the Passive House Trust website, you can search for Duracell. And uh, we did uh, get involved with the first commercial passive house structure in the UK, uh, which was the uh, headquarters for Interserve up in Leicestershire. Uh, and like I said, that is a case study in, on, the, uh, on the Passive House Trust website. So you can go and have a look in there and see what sort of savings they've locked in as a result of using a system like this for the fabric of the building. Um, civic buildings, this is a library, um, interestingly really because you can see that they've created the cantilever sort of uh, opening over the, uh, over the vestibule so you can do interesting things with, uh, with a concrete frame structure that you may struggle to do otherwise with, with masonry and the like. So there are, there's, there's architectural flexibility with systems like this as well which I can explore in a moment. Retail, again, once it's covered up and, and it's finished on the outside, you wouldn't know what the, what the frame is, but the benefit to the contractor is that it goes up quickly um, in all weathers, and therefore there are sort of you know, large savings in terms of turning the project around and realising the cash on the project, and in terms of limiting the prelims on there and, um, by getting the job done quickly and effectively. And just some architectural renders of what's possible with different finishes on the outside, and I'll, I'll cover some of those finishes in, in, a, in a moment uh, uh, later on. 
So what we're really aiming to do, and I think the way that the industry is moving, um, there is a big move towards modular construction. Duracell's not really modular, uh, but in terms of the so sort of um, recognizing the idea of taking uh, operations that would be uh, undertaken on a site and taking them into a factory environment, into a more controlled environment where you're you're not dependent on the weather, uh, where you can actually you know achieve things with automation and, and, and get efficiencies. Uh, there is a lot of the Duracell construction process which goes on in the factory before it gets to the end user. So we are on a sliding scale, somewhere in the mid-range, I guess, in terms of modular. There's still the flexibility on site to make changes and to adjust the system. It's not a flat pack um, uh, house that comes on the back of a truck, uh, but some of those operations have been taken into, into a factory environment which, which provides um, labour savings and time saving on site. Um, we recognise that there's a skill shortage in the UK. Uh, we do um, presentations at Brick Lane Colleges and to, uh, and to trades and we're seeing and you know, it, it, it's common knowledge that we're not getting as, as much uptake in uh, traditional trades in carpentry and, and brick and block laying as we were in the past. Um, so that there is a, a skill shortage which is causing an issue in terms of then being able to create the volume of houses that the government aspires to, to build, 200,000 houses a year plus. Um, is, is really um, quite a lofty aspiration when um, we don't necessarily have the skills coming through for, in the traditional methods to do that. Um, in terms of utilising local companies and, and, and local resources, certainly with Brexit and with sort of trade barriers going up and with uh, um, uncertainty, I guess, over exchange rate fluctuations and things like that, there is increasingly a focus on utilising local companies. Uh, and we are a, a local manufacturer here in the UK. We're a single site operation and uh, we source all our materials locally here as well. So. Um, you know, from a, a practical point of view, that's good for me from inventory management in terms of, like I said, exchange rate fluctuations and certainty around raw materials. Um, we have a, a relatively good handle on that because we're sourcing it all locally and we're buying everything in, in local currency. And the majority of what we what we construct with or what we, we, we make the blocks from is is, is timber, um, which and, and that's not um, that's not timber that's grown overseas, uh, structural uh, timber that would be used in, um, in, in framing houses. This is a uh, end of life, locally grown timber from pallets and cable drums and the like. So it's not um, necessarily subject to the same sort of pricing fluctuations that we're currently seeing as I'm broadcasting this in terms of uh, the cost of timber increasing. And we're all working towards um, a low carbon or zero carbon future. And um, ICF has a, has a part to play in that. Um, certainly woodcrete as a recycled material, but looking also at alkali activated cementitious materials as replacements for concrete in the future with very low carbon, very low embedded carbon. So there are alternatives coming which are perfectly applicable to ICF systems. In terms of the history of the company, and I'm only going to put this in there just briefly to give you some confidence that we're not, uh, we've not been created in, in the last two or three years. Um, Duracell as a concept, and I'll talk about durability in a moment, uh, was was uh, was developed, um, well, certainly Woodcrete as a concept was developed in the 1930s. And so there's been production of, of Duracell materials uh, around the world for many decades. And we have good examples of, and case studies of uh, buildings and acoustic barriers around the world that have stood the test of time. So this is a time served and, and proven system. Uh, and it's now um, in, in private hands around the world. There's various production plants. And like I said, we own our, our, our um, ongoing operation here in the UK as a standalone business, which was, was established here in 2008. And this is where we're, we're based. So it's in Crumlin up in, 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 the, in, the Welsh, um, in the Welsh Valleys near Caerphilly. And uh, this, is, this is the operation. So we have a 50,000 square foot um, internal factory space and we store the units outside. So I'll talk about the properties of the units in a moment, but uh, once they're actually formed, um, they, are, um, they are impervious to the effects of the weather, so therefore we can store them safely outside without any worries about them degrading, breaking down, or doing anything else unsavoury. This is what they're designed for. So uh, we have a fairly uh, extensive um, storage facility, which means that we can store at any one time between fifty and 100,000 units. So we have a decent amount of buffer stock there, Everything you see here is already sold, but we're obviously producing, and so we, we supply out of stock, and then we, um, we backfill that. So um, that's, again, like all locally sourced. This is the inside of the factory, and it's just a, um, from an environmental perspective, from an EPD perspective in terms of um, you know, carbon footprint, this is an unheated factory space. It's a portal frame shed. It's insulated, um, and so there's very few sort of uh, um, operations here that are, that are uh, you know that are, are hungry on, um, on on carbon and and and, uh, and causing us a, an issue from an environmental footprint perspective. So unheated, as I said, the the blocks are formed on the factory floor with an egg laying um, block machine, and that's an exothermic reaction which creates generates some some heat, which um, which does uh, generate heat to to maintain the the temperature in the factory. Uh, without us having to sort of use any other sort of heat sources. 
And you can see here that the units are then laid under plastic as they've been laid down. And these are pre-trimmed units. So these are these are to go through a secondary process where they'll be trimmed and made dimensionally accurate before being shipped out. So the process itself, and I won't dwell on this for too long, but what we take is um, softwood timber. So this is an end of life um, softwood from uh, locally sourced materials. It's namely cable drums and uh, pallets, which we have chipped down by a third party and brought in. And the, the gradation on this is very important. So the actual percentage of, um, of chips of a certain size and gradation is important. So this is all part of our quality plan that we grade this and assess this when it comes in. Now, in its naked state as a, as a softwood material, it's not very desirable as a build material because it's, um, it's flammable, it absorbs moisture, it rots, things eat it. It's not, um, it's not a good material in terms of having properties that you want to build structures out of. And that's where these 1930s technology and this proprietary sort of knowledge comes into play. So what we do is we actually have a, a chemical which is in solution, which we gently dose the, the wood chip with just to neutralize the sugars and the proteins in the wood chip. And we call this mineralization. So we're basically taking it and, and turning it, it's almost fossilizing the, the wood chip so that it becomes completely inert. And once we do that, we're then using it as opposed to um, uh, stone aggregates. We're using the, the wood chip, neutralized wood chip, as an alternative to uh, conventional aggregates. And we use a small amount of, of SEM1 cement. By volume, the material is almost entirely the softwood. And we're looking at the moment at sort of alternative pulverized fly ash and GGBS um, uh, alternatives to uh, cement to actually bond the, the blocks together. But a bonding agent in any case is used. And that wet material is then transported to a, a block machine and the blocks are then laid out on the floor uh, like this. So it's a pretty simple operation. Uh, it's, it's difficult to get it right, so it's very important that you manage the moisture content and the relative humidity. We, we study the hydration in, um, on every floor that we lay, and um, getting that all absolutely correct is, um, is, is something that you have to perfect. It's all BBA certified, and, and so we're, we're BBA audited on a six monthly basis. They come to the factory, they, they take the whole process apart, and they make sure that we're, we're manufacturing to our quality plan. So the blocks are laid on the floor. Um, once they develop strength, we pick them up, and we take them through a secondary process. We pass them through a machine where they're, they're trimmed top and bottom um, to get them dimensionally accurate, and they're also routed out. So there's some, um, um, some uh, gaps and holes uh, uh, routed out of these to um, notches, if you like, um, to allow the concrete to flow through when you fill these with concrete. And that is the idea with a system like this. It's an ICF system, so it's an insulating concrete formwork system. Um, it's grouped in there with, with the polystyrene systems, whereby they're all a form of permanent formwork that provides insulation um, and, um, and provides formwork for pouring wet concrete. So we then either insulate them or not, depending on what they're going to be used for, and we ship them out. So it's a simple process. It's a locally, um, it's a local uh, manufacturing process and um, using local materials. Uh, it, like I said, it's, 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 it's simple, but it's difficult to perfect. So hence why there's a lot of controls over getting it right. And you can see there what it looks like in the factory. Once the blocks are laid out and the, the, the plastic is, is taken off them, so we have sheeting which goes on them, which is reused for years and years. Uh, but that plastic is really there just to con contain the heat um, from the exothermic reaction um, uh, whilst they're actually curing. And this is what they look like once they've developed um, some strength. Now, what does this mean? Well, in terms of the properties that you then have from the finished wood creek material, firstly, it doesn't burn. So uh, this is an oxyacetylene torch. Um, I think a, you know, a building fire is normally around 600 degrees. Um, you know, oxyacetylene torch is, is more like two to 3,000 degrees. Um, what uh, we're trying to demonstrate here is that the, the material doesn't burn. So it has a resistance to fire rating. It's been tested in the UK to 240 minutes. So in terms of um, compartmentation and actually containing smoke and heat and, being, and uh, maintaining its structure and integrity, there's ratings in there which would satisfy the building regs for um, all the applications that I see that it, it being used for. Um, in terms of reaction to fire, um, which has become a requirement now about 18 metres uh, post Grenfell for all materials that form part of the wall. Um, the material has a, a European technical approval, which I'll talk about in a moment, but the European technical approval has had a testing done on the European manufactured product, and, and the woodcrete itself was A2 rated, it was given an A2 rating. So um, we would have to replicate that test on the UK products. At the moment, we're selling into housing, not necessarily into high rise, but suffice to say, this behave like wood once it's been formed, once it's been mineralized, neutralized, and then formed into the blocks with the, uh, with the set one, uh, you have a material which has very much properties in terms of, of burning characteristics or um, non-burning characteristics. 
Um, it doesn't rot either. So in terms of longevity, uh, this is um, we don't have, because we've only been in the UK for 12 years, we don't have good examples of, of, um, of uh, projects that have been around for decades. But this is a project in um, North America, and uh, Duracell is used uh, to form acoustic barriers as well as, as uh, blocks for construction because it's very acoustically absorbative when it's left exposed. And you can see here, this is a um, this is probably a reinforced earth um, earth retaining wall of some sort. So this is concrete, and then above that, you've got acoustic barriers uh, with with steel posts in between them. So these are precast concrete barriers with Duracell um, formed in the formwork at the same time as the as the concrete itself. So poured in conjunction, but that's exposed Duracell. Now this is a 1985 case study. So this was this was photographed when it was finished in 1985. And I think if I go forward here, uh, this photo is 2007. So this is revisiting the same project. That's only 22 years. So we're not talking about a great deal of time there. Um, but when I go close up here, you can see what's happening to the steel posts there. So this looks like a poor design to me. Perhaps I shouldn't be you know, showing this, but uh, you know, the steel work is not a, it's not a Duracell thing. Um, so this is maybe painted steel. Maybe it's not galvanized. And that's really starting to suffer after 22 years. Um, you can see the wet snow here. So this is... Um, all the dirty snow here. This is a Canadian case study, and um, uh, you know the Duracell itself. They're exposed to the elements. Twenty-two years on, is just doing its thing. So it's just inert. Um, it's not breaking down, um, and it's um, you can see it's a highly durable material. On the side of a freeway with a lot of um, um, exhaust fumes, with salt spray from um, from from treating the roads, um, from uh, hot and cold cycles, freeze thaw cycles in in Canada, and you can see that it's it's actually holding up extremely well. Um, it's also interesting that I was, I'm going to mention that there's not a lot of capillary action, if any capillary action with Duracell, so it doesn't suck a lot of moisture. And you can see that here. So in the in the bright sunshine, the, the snow is starting to melt, um, but what, what, where you've got moisture uh, right up against the, the, um, the Duracell itself, it's not tracking up through the structure. It's not sucking that moisture up, which is a, an important characteristic of a build material when you're when you're building solid walls. This is another example, just to give you an idea of durability. So this is another North American example. You can see in the photograph, this was taken in 2010. This was actually constructed in 1955. Uh, it's not a conventional Duracell build as we would do here in the UK with blocks and then cover them with render or brick slips or something like that. This is actually panels again, but it's made exactly the same way. So the wood creeps, it's a, it's a finer wood chip than we would use because it's left exposed, so it's quite aesthetic. Whereas the, the Duracell blocks we're using in the UK, uh, I wouldn't consider them aesthetic. I'm not selling them on the aesthetic properties. They're, they're generally covered up and we want them to be rough so the plasters and renders actually bite into them and key into them nicely. But this is exposed woodcrete. So this is, this is 1955 to 2010. So this is 55 years old uh, and it looks like new. You know, I, I was astounded when I saw this photograph. So the durability of, of uh, woodcrete in what is a much more aggressive environment than we would in, that we would expose it to in the UK when it's actually covered up um, in, in house construction and, and commercial projects shows that it has an, an enormous um, durability to it. Again, this is a project in, um, in um, Windsor, Ontario. It's a hotel that was constructed with Duracell in 1983. And this is, um, I'm not sure how many stories, but it's 20 plus. And um, they just happen to be, it's a concrete frame, but they just happen to use the Duracell uh, as the formwork method. And that's permanent formwork then. So you see when it's actually finished, this is what it looks like. That's 1983. Uh, obviously, we've been in lockdown the last 12 months. I've not been to Canada recently, but um, uh, I took the liberty of, of taking a walk around on Google Street Maps. And you can see the photograph here wasn't taken um, in the last year. It was August 2018, but that's 35 years and counting. Um, I jumped online and checked the um, the hotel and it was taking bookings pre-COVID. So I think uh, that's an example of a 35-year-old building and counting, which is perfectly serviceable and gives you some idea of the of the durability of, um, of Duracell as well. So it doesn't burn, it doesn't rot, um, it doesn't support capillary action. I showed in the, with the melting snow there, but you can you can always acquire a sample of Duracell if you so choose and sit it in a body of water, sit it in a in a puddle or in a tank or something and just let it um, do its thing and see how, how far the moisture actually tracks up through it. Um, obviously the idea with a system like this is, is that you're forming a, a solid wall. So you um, it's important that you, you don't have something that's gonna suck moisture and draw moisture into the structure. And like I said, this has been constructed with around the world for, for decades now. And, and one of the important properties is it's not sucking moisture either into it or, or up through it. 
um, a lot of building materials, masonry materials and concrete, um, they have a capillary action which will, will draw moisture many metres through a structure, vertically and, and horizontally. And um, having a, an open matrix, uh, quite lightweight, uh, low density material that doesn't support the moisture and acts more like a vertical drain uh, is, is an important characteristic. Uh, I don't know how relevant it is really in the UK, but it's certainly resistant to wood boring insects. So it's an alkaline environment in its finished condition when we when we finish processing it, which doesn't present itself as a as a food source to, to wood boring insects. So where we're selling this into equatorial regions, that becomes quite um, critical. And there's studies that have been done to to show that it's not going to be eaten by anything. Um, it's fully breathable, so I can talk about waterproofing and below ground and its uses there. But it's not in, it's not uh, it doesn't support moisture, but at the same time it's breathable, so it, it it's porous. So when you pour wet concrete into the into the void here, it will dewater that concrete through the actual matrix of the Duracell itself, which has a benefit in terms of not having to vibrate it and get the moisture out any other way. Um, it's a high recycled material content, which I've already touched upon, so we sort of we, we know the situation there. And what this means then is that you can enjoy a wall construction with very low U values. Um, in terms of junction details, we've had some independent studies done and some information published in the, in the build guide showing the junction values. But with ICF systems as a whole, you're creating a monolithic um, concrete frame within a permanent formwork. So you have very good closed, um, uh, closed details, not a lot of air leakage and other leakage around, um, around the junctions, which is obviously desirable. Um, the air tightness of the actual matrix of the Duracell itself is reliant on the secondary finishes. So if you want to get down to a passive level of, of air tightness, there are membranes, you can things you can spray on, or you can use wet finishes like plasters and renders on there, and you can get down to a very low level of air, of, um, of, of air leakage, um, dependent on the finishes that you so choose. Very good acoustic performance. If you leave it exposed, it's a, a, a acoustically absorptive. Uh, but even if you cover it up, which you would do in a conventional house construction, you've still got a concrete frame, which is a high, um, is, is a dense uh, material. So you've got a good thermal mass, but you've also got um, um, a good density there, which is which is a good sound deadening properties, good separation within a within a building. Um, I talked about fire testing. That's the 240 minute test. That's the resistance to fire test. Uh, there is ETA information about um, reaction to fire as well, although that's applicable to the to the European product. So the range um, of units that we actually manufacture at the moment, uh, we do four types. So it's quite uh, straightforward, and I, I like this from an engineering perspective, uh, the simplicity of the system. So we have a, a 365 unit and a 300. Now these are insulated, and these are designed to form the envelope of your building. So uh, you have concrete on the inner, inner skin and the insulation to the outer skin. And the 365 designates the thickness of that wall. So that's 365 mil thick across this dimension here, 300. The 250 is obviously 250 thick and the 170 is 170 thick. Now the 250 is generally used for a party wall between two dwellings. So if you need to achieve your 45 decibel um, airborne sound reduction as per the building regs, then this has a thicker core of concrete within it. It's open-ended, you get a more continuous flow of concrete and we have a detail for how this joins into the um, external walls where it butts into the external walls or, or is in fact built into the external walls. Um, to prevent any acoustic flanking around there. So that's really a party wall. If you're going to build a row of terraces or something like that, then we would advise using these for um, for the dividing walls between those dwellings. And then we do a 170, uh, which you can use for party walls within a, um, a single dwelling. Um, you could use stud walls, you know, 100 mil thick. This is slightly thicker in terms of the footprint that it's going to take up. So it really depends whether um, space is at a premium or not. But the advantage you get with something like this is it becomes a structural wall then that you can bear um, floors onto if you need to, depending on the sort of nature of the design. Um, whereas obviously with, with plasterboard stud work uh, walls, you wouldn't be able to do that. So it's horses for courses. Sometimes we supply um, Duracell for the external envelope of the building and it's something else is done internally. Sometimes it's the whole shooting match. Um, it, it just really depends on the project. And you can see here, so these are the 250 units. So if you can imagine, this is an external wall. Um, the outside is, is over here uh, on the outside of the insulation. So what you would do if you're butting up a party wall um, to an ex existing external wall is you would actually cut this open and you would build this into the external leaf and then you would pour it all as one. So the concrete would flow and actually create one continuous monolithic um, concrete frame with no um, opportunity for sort of acoustic flanking around the edges and a, and a super strong thermal mass, um, efficient and um, uh, neut neutral or um, inert structure that sits there, doesn't move, doesn't, um, doesn't uh, have any snagging issues or anything else to, uh, that, that, uh, that can be associated with some other build methods. 
So within the range, uh, you have standards, faces, and corners. So if I was building with a 365, for example, you'd have a standard unit. And when we take it through the secondary process in the factory, we route it out front and back. So we actually, um, we actually op open it up here. And, and that allows the concrete to flow through. So if you were building a run of a wall that was, say, 10 metres off in this direction, you would have these side by side, uh, and the concrete would flow through and connect those all together and create a continuous, um, a continuous structure. If you have a door or a window opening or some other opening in the, in the structure, then you may want to use a face unit which is blanked off at one end. And you would offer that up then to the, to the window opening, for example, um, so that your concrete doesn't flow through and out into the jams of your, of your door or your window or, 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 the, um, or across the soffit at the top. So that's what that would be used for. And then we have a corner unit, which is fairly self-explanatory, but when you go around corners, um, you would just take this out on site. You can cut that out and allow the concrete to flow around. And with these three unit types, albeit you can cut them on the site, you can adapt them, you can shape them, you can do whatever you want with them. But with these three unit types, you should be able to build straight off your foundation all the way up to your gables if you so choose, uh, or any, any part of the structure uh, in, in conjunction with other build methods as well. So it's a dry stack system. I haven't really gone into any of the details of how this goes together yet, but it, it is a dry stack system. So it's on a brick bond. So you, you, you're building these like brickwork uh, on a staggered brick bond. Uh, but they are um, there's only eight units per square meter. So I didn't mention that with a family of units, there may be 365 or 300, etc. But they're all half a meter long and they're all 250 mil um, tall. So that, that there's that common denomination, which means that there's eight units per square meter. Now, it's a solid wall construction, so you don't have to think about inner leaves and outer leaves or anything like that. So if you can imagine dry stacking without mortars, uh, just using a line and a level, um, how many you could actually you could do if you're set up for it. Um, it multiples quicker of um, on some traditional methods, which is where some of the benefit comes from that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. You can use it below the damp proof course. So like I said, I showed you some examples of exposed Duracell that's been there for um, 50 years plus in, in, in a completely exposed environment. You can have it permanently saturated. It can be below ground. We can use them for retaining walls, whatever you like. So um, certainly below your damp proof course, that gives you the flexibility to build straight off your foundation up to DPC and then carry on above that. Now, well, I'll talk about damp proof courses in a minute, but I, I said there's no capillary action, but there is still a need for a damp proof course. Um, you can build two and a half metres freestanding um, per concrete pour. So you, you know, you're dry stacking these. We don't prop these. There's no diagonal props or anything with the Durasol system. What we do do though, and if you go to the build guide, which you can download off our website, we would ply these corners. So you would um, you get some sheet supply and you can screw it straight into the wood crete just to stabilize this whilst you're pouring the concrete so that it doesn't move at all. And you don't get out of alignment with your, with your levels and your lines that you've set up for, uh, for the dimensions of the structure. So it's got quite simple bracing um, operation. It's all covered in the build guide. Uh, and then you can take those off and you can reuse those further up the structure. But the advantage of being able to pour to two and a half meters is that that's a single story lift essentially. So if you're using a pump every time you come to site, you have to hire a pump in to actually pump concrete into these, then you want to limit the number of times you're hiring a pump if possible. And this is where the economies of scale really start to come in. Because if you're building a house as a self builder, that's great, you can come in, you hire a pump. But if you're building 10, 15, 20, 50 houses, and you've got, I don't know, maybe uh, 10 bases um, that, are, that are up to sort of first floor, then you can hire a pump for the day and you can, you can pump all of them in a single day and you can actually make uh, the best use of, of, of hiring this plant and equipment in. So there are certainly economies of scale that can be um, harnessed when, you, when you're building commercially. In terms of the, the consumption of concrete, it's a cubic metre of concrete per 10 square metres of Duracell wall. And that's in this configuration here. So we've got insulation in there. Uh, there is a void. It's 120 mil thick, um, which you can use then to structurally design for bearing uh, floors and other things onto. Uh, but that tends to consume around a cubic metre of concrete per, per 10 square metres of, uh, of wall. Again, the build guide covers different configurations because sometimes we supply these uh, units without insulation, say below ground or in retaining walls. And obviously they're going to they're use a little bit more concrete if there's, if there's a bigger void there because there's no insulation. But that's the general configuration. Um, they're very easy to adapt on site and, and easy to cut. If you're watching this, you're probably already on YouTube, which means you can look at the other little clips that are on there for cutting and adapting and, and, um, and modifying the units, which is anything that will cut wood will cut. Um, will cut Duracell, so you can use an alligator saw, recip saw. Um, you can even use a hand saw for, um, if, if you've got a couple to cut, but they, you know, they're pretty robust, so I, wouldn't, um, I, I would spare your forearms and actually um, um, and be using a recip or something like that for any, any decent um, operation. 
So as I mentioned on YouTube, which is probably where you are if you're watching this, but in any case, there are sh much shorter clips than what you're watching here, just showing you how to sort of form goal posts for openings and cutting units and putting pipe work through, bracing, cut blocks, corners, uh, and all these sorts of simple operations. Um, it's also then covered in the build guide as well, sort of with pictures um, walking you through those processes. Um, one of the advantages then of, of um, a system like that is, is that you can build in any weather. So this is a job in Iceland, which was constructed in 2020 um, during lockdown, unfortunately. So I wasn't able to visit this one whilst it was being built. But you can see here, pretty cold in Iceland, not as cold as some of the Nordic countries, but gets down to sort of minus 10 or so. Um, uh, you get uh, a fair bit of snow there. You get very windy conditions, um, but you can continue to build. So it's not that's not holding up the construction for these guys. Uh, they can just get on with it. Uh, you can pour down to minus six degrees is what our Canadian friends are telling us in terms of pouring wet concrete into an insulated mould. So it is going straight into insulated formwork. So um, you can pour down to, to sort of minus temperatures. And I think operating at minus six would cover most of the scenarios that you would encounter in the UK during the working year. Maybe there's some parts of Scotland where there's certain times of the year where it may be difficult to sort of pour concrete, but I think it's fairly limited. Um, you can see here a lot of reinforcement. That's, like I said, this is an Icelandic job. Um, they're, they're in a seismic zone up there. Uh, the plate boundaries are moving apart there, so it's actually not... Um, uh, the, the, the earthquake activity that they get tends to be milder than, than on the, the plate boundaries on the sort of Pacific Rim where they're coming together. But nevertheless, they, they still have to have um, that incorporated into their design codes. So when you're building concrete frame structures there, you are obliged to design reinforcement into it. And that's not the case in the UK. You can design to the Euro code, you can design unreinforced concrete, and you can justify the walls unreinforced. So we do a lot of Duracell construction in houses uh, where there's very little reinforcement apart from sort of lintels for doors and windows, but not anything like this. This is the sort of thing you would see in, in uh, retaining walls below ground, uh, but not not generally in house construction. But it's you know every house is different. Sometimes you've got vaulted ceilings and other things that are, are putting lateral loads onto your walls. Uh, but generally speaking, um, you wouldn't see anything like this. Really, just in there to to, to demonstrate the point about uh, all weather building, which I think really should tie into or pique the interest of contractors who want to make money and want to get onto the job and get it done and not be um, not be um, held hostage by the weather. If you're uh, building below ground, this is a, um, a basement. And so you can see this is, there's going to be backfill material here. So these would have reinforcement in them because they're performing a retaining um, a function as, as well as, as insulation and, and, and carrying vertical loads. They're also carrying lateral loads. Now, if you're building below ground, like I said, these blocks are they're porous. They will dewater the wet concrete. They're breathable, which has its advantages. Um, but it means that below ground, you have to um, uh, you, you have to submit to the um, to the the, the the British standard, which um, which defines structural waterproofing um, uh, below below ground on subterranean structures. And that's no different if you were building this out of masonry, if you're building it out of uh, shuttered concrete or anything else below ground. So you would need to tank this. Um, we have um, companies who are aware of Duracell, there's Wickermole, there's Delta Membranes. There is a, these are good reputable companies that have um, certified surveyors in structural waterproofing who can advise on the, the best solution depending on what the use is of the, um, of the space that you're creating below ground. But suffice to say that there are standard details that exist that they have on file and um, you can uh, use their tanking systems and their membrane systems onto the, onto the Duracell which they specify. So we would take advice from them and I'd defer to them. The Duracell is doing the, um, the formwork exercise, so it's containing the wet concrete during a concrete pour and it's also acting as an insulator for the life of the structure. And the structural waterproofing is doing the structural waterproofing. So they're independent of each other, but they can very much be used in conjunction. Now, if you really want to get into the details, as I mentioned, you can go onto the website and under technical resources, there is the uh, technical manual and the build guide. And in there, all of the movies and the sort of things that you see on YouTube, uh, you can find in here in sort of um, a painting by numbers kind of approach to all the different operations that you can do with, with Duracell. If there's anything that's missing in there, then you can get in touch with us, but it's, um, it's fairly exhaustive in terms of forming lintels and, 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 and creating openings and, and all, all manner of things that you would sort of encounter when you're, when you're building with a system like this and what we would, what we would recommend and advocate. 
Um, in terms of how the system works, so you've got concrete, the, the green signifies the concrete, and the concrete is sitting on the inside. So where it says strip foundation here, this is the, in, the inside of the building, uh, and this is outside. So anything you read about thermal mass tells you that you know, the thermal mass should be, um, should be able to absorb heat internally and then release that heat. Um, but what we're doing here with the insulation to the outside of the, of the concrete is we're trying to protect that concrete from the, the, the external swings in temperature that you get in a temperate climate like the UK, where we may have a 20 degree swing in temperatures between you know, the middle of the night and the middle of the day. And, um, and those fluctuations can cause um, um, you know, the, the, the temperature within the building to, to fluctuate as well. The thermal mass helps to smooth that out. There's a huge lag effect that's created um, as, as the Duracell um, or the concrete infill will absorb heat during the, the, the heat of a day. And um, you can have a time lag of 8, 10, 12 hours before that starts to then transfer that heat internally, by which time the temperature outside is completely different again. So there's a, there's a real benefit to having a, a lag effect through thermal mass um, structures. And that's proven in the real world. I've got an example in the, um, in the presentation later on that I can show you. Now, I did mention that you can use this below damp proof course. So you can see here uh, what looks like um, a strip footing or some sort of trench fill, and the Durasol has been built directly off of that. So here, we, we're not a, an agent for, for Durasol. We, we, we are the manufacturers of the, of the material. So we, we can supply them uninsulated if you so choose. And if you're below ground and it's not forming part of the envelope of the structure where it has a, a U, U rating requirement, uh, then we can um, always supply them empty. And that's what's happened here. So these will be filled with concrete. Um, I mentioned the need for a damp proof course, so we would lay a damp. We would fill these up um, to the top. We would lay a damp proof course across the, the the entire width of the wall, and then we'd build off of that. And that's really because building control are expecting you to see to see a damp proof course. Um, if you're in a radon area, then you need some sort of membrane anyway that you would lap into your, into your DPM. Um, and it's also just good practice. You've got concrete infill here. So whilst the Duracell itself is not sucking any moisture up vertically, you will get a little bit, potentially get some capillary action through the concrete. So just having um, a, a, a DPC across there, which costs pennies in the scheme of a, of a project, um, is, is a good belt and braces approach and it's good practice. And that's what we advocate. In terms of the lintels, so again, I, one of the appeals to me, I was approached to come and run Durasol and I looked at it from an engineering perspective and tried to understand what the, the pros and cons were. But I, I like the simplicity of the, of the system and on site, um, I think there's a benefit to, to limiting the number of moving parts and the number of units you're having to think about. So what we've done here, this is a goalpost for a doorway opening. And whereas the blocks are normally stacked on their side, you know, as, as, as you would a block work, th these are soldier course, these are stood on their end. And um, if I look uh, end on into the side of this lintel opening, you can see what's there, what's been formed there. So we've eventually, effectively formed um, a void, which we can then pour concrete into to form a lintel. So we put some rebar on spaces in there. And this is just indicative. We don't know exactly what rebar we would need for the, for the opening. That just needs to be designed. But um, we put some rebar in there on spaces, and that's, that's going to project either side of the opening. And then when the concrete is poured for, for the rest of the walls, it'll be poured at the same time for the lintel. So it's incorporated in. The whole thing's wrapped in woodcrete, which is a good insulator. So there's no thermal bridging to think about. There's no additional precast concrete lintels or other things to, to source and to think about integrating with the Durasol. It's, it's all done as one. So again, it's quite an elegant solution. It's quite quick and easy to do. And um, for, for openings of this size, even up to quite large openings of three or four metres, it, it's, it's feasible that you can actually form lintels uh, within, within the Durasol itself. In terms of integrating floors, um, you can integrate uh, heavy floors, so precast um, concrete planks, as, as, as I see here on the right, and then beam and block floors as well. So they will actually bear onto the Durasol walls uh, or the concrete within the Durasol walls. And depending on where they arrive at the wall, um, you, would, um, you can actually just adapt the blocks so that they can actually receive that floor and it can sit directly onto the, uh, onto the concrete uh, within. Now, with, with a normal house, you could just sit that directly onto it. If you're into um, high rise or other things where you're having to consider disproportionate collapse and other sort of aspects in the, in the design, then you can actually obviously put starter bars and rebar in here and you can turn that into the floors and you can, you can connect these all together and tie it all together from a disproportionate collapse calculation um, perspective as well. So there's a lot you can do, but the idea is that the floor systems that are heavy like this would sit and bear onto the, onto the concrete uh, just as they would with a precast uh, or a poured in situ concrete wall, you would, you would bear floors onto those. And you can see that here at ground level. I guess beam and block is more common at sort of ground level. 
Um, so this would be a suspended floor for whatever reason. Maybe there's radon here and they want to have a vented, uh, vented uh, void beneath. Uh, but that's sitting on the Durasol walls or the concrete infill within the Durasol walls. And then maybe higher up with a residential project like this, they may use something like timber floors. And if you are using a timber floor, then uh, we would, this is our standard detail for that, and there's CAD drawings for this available. So you would have a, um, a, a wall plate or a trimmer beam, it depends on um, what you call it, but it's really just a timber that you would bolt to the wall. So you, the bolts would go through into the structural concrete. And they could be cast in bolts, it could be threaded rod with nuts and washers, or these could be post installed. Um, uh, self-cutting of self-tapping concrete screws or even resin and resin anchors and, and bolts uh, designed to carry whatever load um, happens to be on these on these particular floors depending on the span so this is the easiest way to do it building them in is a bit of a pain to be honest and you get interaction between the timber and the concrete um, and from a, a carpenter's point of view having a sim a single trimmer beam that you put on there and then hang your joist hangers on it means you only have to level it once and then you can drop your joists in there knowing that, that everything's nice and level so this is the best solution i think to uh, to putting timber floors in in terms of finishes on the outside, you can have cladding systems, renders, uh, slip systems. These seem to be exploding now in terms of acrylic and also natural, uh, natural cut brick slip systems that, that are available on the market. Um, stone slips as well, so you can have real quarried stone, or and you can actually, depending on the thickness and the weight of the stone, in, in a situation like this, this is quarried uh, locally to the project, and these were sort of 30 mil or so thick, I believe, and were actually bonded directly to the wood crete. Uh, with, a, with a Parex Matey um, a bonding agent, which provides water tightness and also uh, the, the necessary bond to, um, to have them here. And this is really all just wallpaper. This is just decorative. This is not um, serving any structural purpose. It's just there to, uh, to give the aesthetic on the outside. So from that perspective, the Durasol itself is forming the concrete frame. It's doing the thermal work. The concrete frame is doing, is doing the lifting work. The finishes on the inside, on the outside, um, is creating the, the the water tightness and the air tightness. And what you actually put on it then is, like I said, just purely aesthetic. Um, Parix have partnered with with Jurisol in the past to, on the BBA certificate. So there is a a, a Monorex um, a Monocouche system that they um, that has been tested onto Jurisol um, as part of the BBA certificate to to, um, to allow that to be used in in various zones of the UK in terms of weather exposure. So you can use that. It really depends on the, the warranty provider. Uh, they all have different requirements in terms of the finishes on the outside. So I would recommend that we, we speak to you on a project about who your structural warranty provider is, local authority building control, and everybody else is aware of what the intention is and how you want to finish it and, and, and everything else uh, before, before you embark on a project. But all sorts of finishes and, and aesthetic finishes are, are possible onto Durasol. In terms of cost savings on uh, commercial projects, let me just... I shrunk my head there. Let me just move my head out of the way. Um, so, I'm not going to I'm not going to price projects um, on a YouTube video, but just to give you a, a flavour, um, we had a recent project which um, which involved 11 units built on a uh, on a commercial site, and the subcontractor had never built with Durasol before, so the, the package of actually building the frames was was subbed out to a, a third party, and they were a masonry contractor. So we trained them and we 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 supported them to to, to build the units in Durasol. And then we asked them afterwards uh, what that would have cost them if they'd done it um, conventionally with block and block and also brick and block. Now, this is a, a, a point in time. So, you know, there's, there's inflation and cost change. So I wouldn't fixate too much on the actual cost, but I would be interested more in terms of the comparison um, across those different methods com com compared to traditional masonry. So when they rolled it all together, and so this costing here is the materials and the labour and all the associated components that, that it's going to cost them to actually put the thing together. And, and they came up with £185 a square metre, which was, the, which was the, um, their experience on that particular project. And then they went away and did the, 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 the whole um, uh, assessment, um, of, of which I'm not at liberty to share the, the complete breakdown, but of all the costs and associated materials and labour that would have been involved if they'd done it in block and block and also brick and block. And also the, the program period over which over which they would have to um, construct those, so they were able to actually put these eleven units together in Durasol in thirteen weeks. Um, they believe it would have taken them sixteen weeks in block and block, and eighteen weeks in in, in brick and block. Obviously, with the dress uh, brick on the outside, that's more um, that's more um, time consuming. So, so there was a saving in terms of the unit rate, but there's also a saving in terms of the time. Now, without sort of being at liberty to share all of their details. I think that the Durasol components, and this is probably not really where the action is, but the Durasol components um, in terms of the material costs and in terms of the complexity of that 
um, is uh, is an advantage, perhaps just purely from a management of, of materials and inventory in your supply chain. When you build um, a house like this, you're going to be looking at insulated units themselves, so the Duracell that comes pre-insulated, um, ready mixed concrete, which is coming to site and getting pumped in, rebar for lintels, um, maybe a little bit of, uh, of ply for, for bracing corners, etc., which you can recycle and reuse that through the project. But there's not a lot of moving parts there. Uh, the breakdown that they had then for masonry components was blocks, bricks, insulation, ties, cavity closers. Obviously, there's a cavity, so you need you need cavity trays, you need cavity closers. Uh, you also need um, materials for mixing mortars, so you need cement, sand, you need separate lintels. There are movement joints in these particular um, in this particular type of construction. You've got cavity trays at the slab level. This, these were poured onto onto rafts, so um, or built onto rafts. Sorry. So you know there are there are quite a lot of components there. Um, if, if I'm hand on heart honest, I don't think the saving with Duracell is on the materials, although that there is an advantage in just not having to manage so many materials. I think the advantages really come into into um, into into play with the prelims and with the labour savings. So we didn't account for weather in this. These were built um, between um, August and October. So the, I think the weather was fairly kind. There wasn't too many lost days. But obviously the NHBC, they have guidance on cold weather working. They have guidance on hot weather working, also on excessive rain working. And these are all things that will have an impact on uh, traditional masonry construction in terms of mortars actually developing strength too quickly, too slowly, or, or obviously excessive rain, which can have an impact on, on bricklayers and being able to work in, in those sorts of conditions. Um, no such issue exists with Duracell. This is a trial we ran at a um, at a plant of a manufacturer that makes um, uh, uh, alternative concretes, low carbon concretes. It's difficult to see here, but we're in the absolute pouring rain. Uh, this was constructed within about 40 minutes or so. Um, I don't know how long that would take to build in, in conventional masonry, but certainly in the pouring rain, it wouldn't even have, have got off um, got started. So. Um, that, that is a, a real benefit. When I ask contractors how much time they lose to poor weather, um, I've been asking that question for a number of years now, and the average response seems to be somewhere around a day a week. And obviously much more so in the winter where you can lose a week here, a week there, and not so much in the summer. But just a day a week is 20% of your working time. And with the prelim costs just ticking over in the background, that can really add up. So we haven't allowed for that in the, in the calculation, but that is a real, uh, that is a real aspect as well. Again, this is a housing association scheme in South Wales, pouring rain, Duracell units going up in, in, in the inclement weather. A lot of the operations are held up, but the Duracell can go up um, without, um, without hitch in, in that sort of, those sorts of conditions um, without any ill effects. And that's me in Iceland. So we did training up in Iceland, very cold um, and, and uh, driving rain, driving sleet. Um, cold conditions that you wouldn't really feasibly be able to sort of construct in with a lot of the traditional methods where we were quite able to sort of continue with uh, with Duracell without any trouble. Um, aside from the weather, there's prelim savings to the main contractor. So we have the sort of the, the, the built up cost there for the different uh, methods. What that didn't allow for or what that didn't sort of feed into was the um, the cost to, the, to the, the, the client themselves. Now, a project like that, it's feasible. And the sort of numbers that I was hearing was that for a project of that sort of size where you've got cabins on site where you've got people dedicated to the project you've got plant and equipment insurance policies you've got um, uh, security and all these other things going on that it was costing in the region of a thousand pounds a day to run a site of that sort of size <clears throat> and you can see here in the background you've got sort of cabins on on this particular commercial project so uh, there's a lot of moving parts here there's a lot of um, there's a lot of costs that are ticking over all the time that the, that the job is operational um, storage facilities plant and equipment. So it's, it's, it's pretty reasonable to, to make an assumption on a thousand pound a day as, as a cost. And, and, uh, and that sort of number has been validated around projects that I've been involved with up and down the country. So if you can deliver a project in 13 weeks, as opposed to say um, 16 or 18 weeks, well then, you know, a thousand pounds a day over three weeks, you're talking, um, what's that, 21,000 pounds, you know, this starts to become very significant very quickly. Um, there's no allowance for adjusted labour rates either. So if you're building traditional masonry, um, th they are skilled trades. You, you need um, you need people who've be, who've been educated and trained fully in those and have got their qualifications and have have, have served their time in those trades to be able to to build well uh, with with brick and block work. I'm not saying that the Duracell is an unskilled operation, but uh, we can teach um, we can teach labourers to, to to build with Duracell. Um, very quickly within within a couple of days so your 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 skilled skill level within your labor force does not need to be the same you could have 
um, supervision of semi-skilled labour um, with, with their head screwed on, who've been properly trained, who can actually build with Duracell more cost-effectively from a labour perspective than, um, than, than having to get skilled trades in to do it. And there's no um, allowance for the quicker profit realisation. If you can turn a project around quickly, um, obviously there's financing costs that are ticking away in the background. You can you can um, you can repay those loans quicker. You can realise the cash from from selling these properties and and unlock in the profit. So from a from a cash flow and from a um, um, a debt financing um, perspective, there's 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 a, there's a benefit there to being able to turn it around quicker. So, and that just revisits those those uh, uh, those slides again. Uh, the one thing I would mention here, if I'm going to be totally honest and, and, and compare apples with apples, the brick uh, case study there, that is finished on the outside. Obviously, block and block, you wouldn't leave it exposed and neither would you do so with the Duracell. So you would have to um, render that or put slips or something on that. So you could probably add another 30, 40 pound a square meter onto these. Still significantly less than brick and block. And um, and you would, like I said, you'd have to add that cost onto the, the block and block in the same way you would to the Duracell. So comparatively wise, these would move at the same same sort of rate. Um, and you can you can you can feed in behind and you can render or brick slip um, these systems as they're going up. So it, it doesn't push the program out because you can do them in, in, in conjunction at the same time. Uh, but just to be fair and to compare apples with apples, obviously the, the dress brick on the outside means that that is the that's the finished aesthetic look there. And like I said, these prices these 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 numbers will move. If you want to understand more about the breakdown of that, then please approach us. We can we can give you some more numbers. I've got some other studies I've done myself on this and assumptions I've made that I've had sense checked by the industry uh, for, for sort of different size schemes, 50 house schemes and 100 house schemes and, and what that might look like, what the prelims look like and all the other sort of associated costs and give you a, a full breakdown. So it is it is available. I have gone through that, that exercise. Uh, in terms of compliance, um, Duracell is uh, LABC and BBA um, certified, so there's a registered detail in the um, LABC um, registry and there's a BBA certification. As well as that, there is a European technical approval, so you would argue that maybe we don't need um, a, a BBA certificate with a European technical approval, but I know in the UK uh, everybody is very fixated on, on local certification and BBA is the, is the established standard. So we're fully BBA certified and, and that, that feeds through into auditing and the factory on a six monthly basis as well. So that's live on the website today. You can go to the BBA um, website, you can look up Duracell and you can find this the certification. Um, in terms of uh, mortgages and, and lending against um, uh, Duracell builds, uh, there is a trade association called the ICFA, so that's the, the Insulated Concrete Formwork Association, and reputable members are vetted and then allowed to join that association. And uh, the association has a blanket letter from the Council of Mortgage Lenders uh, which recognises ICF as a standard form of construction. And that is for members of the ICFA. So you need to be able to demonstrate that you're a member. But if you are, then we have it in writing from, from the Council of Mortgage Lenders, which um, normally is enough to convince a mortgage lender. Obviously, there's hundreds of mortgage lenders out there, so not all of them have heard of, of Duracell. But we have brokers that we work through, uh, and, and we have also support, like I said, from the Trade Association, so that you can get a mortgage from, I would say, 95% of lenders will, will lend on, on, a, on a Duracell build. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's a concrete frame. So it's not um, a new panelized system of construction. It is a, it is a, a, a very well recognized form of construction in the sense that the, the Duracell is just form work. It's just an insulator. The actual frame itself is, um, is, is concrete. So uh, that, that's a fairly low risk um, proposition for, for a mortgage lender once they understand that. Um, in terms of, of performance, I talked about thermal mass and um, all of these build systems have published U values, mostly um, uh, generated through uh, software that models U values for different sort of wall buildups. Um, there's a company out there called Atomate. We have no sort of commercial tie up with them, but they, this company does uh, uh, heating and insulation, uh, heating and ventilation systems, so smart systems for your home and uh, for commercial properties and, and developments as well. And so they have sensors in, in, in the buildings which detect. Um, uh, movement, detect air quality and switch on and off heating and switch on and off uh, ventilation systems, etc. Um, so part of a uh, sort of smart home revolution. And they were involved in building some uh, houses in Cardiff, which uh, I was unaware of at the time before I joined Duracell. But uh, these are houses which they which they happen to build out of, uh, of Duracell material. So you can see here uh, a lot of Cardiff is uh, Victorian and Edwardian terraced homes. Uh, these two were demolished and were rebuilt uh, using Duracell, which they selected because they wanted something with um, with a good thermal performance and a good um, uh, high thermal mass and well sealed envelope. So you can see here it going up. And once it's finished and it's rendered on the outside, 
um, you wouldn't know that it's any different from the, the, the houses around it. Uh, but these were formed into student apartments, two on the ground floor, two on the, on the first floor and, and two in the, uh, on the second floor. And these were then fitted with sensors and they were actually monitored over a 12 month period through the beast from the east winter and into the, into the hot summer uh, to see what sort of energy demand, amongst other things, um, they, they generated. And the results that they had, so this is real life um, information rather than sort of modelling new values to try and give you um, a indirect understanding of what they might do in the real world. This is actually, this is straight from the horse's mouth information from actual demand in the real world. And the average um, energy demand uh, within these apartments was 12.48 kilowatt hours per metre squared per year. Now the entry levels or threshold for energy demand for passive house is 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. So it actually on average came in under the passive house threshold. And the lowest reading was 5.26 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. So you've got extremely efficient, low energy demand properties. And this was not extraordinary fabric design by their, by their own um, uh, admission. Uh, there's a peer-reviewed paper that's available. I'm happy to send it to anybody who wants to read it. Uh, so a university um, peer-reviewed paper on this. And it, it's a, you know, a combination of both um, reasonable fabric design and automated control systems. So this, I think, shows the effects of thermal mass, which is more cost effective to construct. This envelope was more cost effective because of the labor saving than traditional, um, than traditional methods. And the, the heating and ventilation system which was installed was, was, um, along the, was more cost effective than a, than a wet heating system and some of the more traditional heating and cooling systems. Um, and yet it's, it's been able to perform at a, at a passive or close to passive standard without being designed to that standard. So this makes it very applicable for housing associations and the like because it's cost effective to build with, but it also gives you low energy demand on an ongoing basis. So if you've got um, vulnerable uh, tenants, people who are in fuel poverty, then, and you're a housing association, then something like this gives you an opportunity to have um, you know, low construction costs and low ongoing maintenance costs for these buildings. Plus, and I don't want to sort of, I'm not here to advertise at, Atomate necessarily, but having monitoring and sensors in, in these means that, that, that um, they're very easy to manage. Um, as opposed to having to get it, get in these to sort of get gas certificates and the like every year and get access to, to, to properties, which is which can be difficult. So there are, there's a range of benefits, but really I was going to focus on the, um, the, the the fabric benefit that the Duracell brings to a, to a build like that. So we know in the real world that they're highly energy efficient. Now, if you have other applications for Duracell or you want to dip your toe and you don't want to go building houses straight away, but you want to sort of try this out, it's very easy to build retaining walls with um, with this material. And retaining walls would have, just like the Icelandic example, would have uh, reinforcement in those. Obviously, they're retaining uh, materials as lateral loads in there, and they will need to be designed as, as reinforced concrete retaining walls. And we have information on that. We've partnered with a consulting firm who's given us information on rebar schedules and what can be achieved to the um, to the design code. So um, that's that's it. that's freely available. I can send that out to whoever's interested, but it's uh, probably most applicable to structural engineers who want to look at specifying this. But very quick to go together as a retaining wall. If I jump back, you can see um, you know you, you're dry stacking these. You can thread the rebar in and lap them as you go. You can lie reinforcement horizontally as well as vertically. So there's a lot of flexibility there with, with retaining structures. So in terms of why choose Duracell, very fast construction, so reducing your, pre, your prelim costs, and I think that's really where the savings are. You know, you want to um, lock those savings in on, on, on large scale schemes, really. That's kind of where the economies of scale come in. And we have developers who've dipped their toe in and built one or two built, um, properties just to see how it works and just to get any of the teething issues out of the way, get used to using the system. And once proven, you can then go on and actually start really locking in those benefits with, uh, with dedicated teams who know what they're doing, building with it and can, can lock in all those benefits. Labour saving costs um, reductions, which I've kind of touched upon, but again, happy to uh, chew the fat with anybody who wants to approach us about that sort of thing. Very little snagging as well. So you imagine this is a concrete frame structure. Um, there's very few moving parts in there. There's no movement joints. So if you wanted to work backwards from uh, a starting point of having a building that is very low snag, which again, from a commercial perspective, means not going back and having to uh, retrofit and fix things, then, then Duracell is, is a good starting point. And we've had one or two commercial developers who've, who've, who've had that um, priority from the outset. So we want a low snagging um, structure how would you build houses from something which is um, which has a very little snagging to do? Uh, a concrete frame is obviously up there. It just sits there. It's 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 monolithic, um, and and there's no sort of um, 
there's very little that you can actually think about where you'd have to go back and retrofit or, or, or snag with it. If you're going to build a concrete frame uh, for, for domestic applications, ICF is a good way to go. If you're going to go ICF, with then wood creeps you know, from a renewable perspective is, a, is, is, is certainly a, a good way to go. So that's where some developers have, has, have arrived at Duracell as a, as a choice when starting with a sort of snagging as a, as a priority. I think it's simple from a supply chain perspective because you don't have all those uh, components to think about. It's just the units, um, ready mixed concrete and uh, and uh, rebar here and there with some. Uh, you know, there's no there's no propping, so it's just uh, uh, ply for bracing. Um, so really, just three or four components as opposed to sort of dozens that you can get into if you're not careful with um, with certain build methods. And an all weather building um, system. So. Now, this was inherited. Um, there's, there's people doing this in Siberia, in Canada, in Japan. We're selling it into Iceland now. So we're talking about um, places where you get very extreme weather uh, and you want your build program to, to have some certainty because you, if you start losing a few days and you're, it's costing you a £1,000 a day to run your site, then that can, that can get really painful really quickly. And with something like this, uh, you're not beholden to the weather. And certainly in these changing times that we live in where the weather seems to be getting more extreme, more extremes of temperature, uh, both hot and cold and, 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 uh, and more rainfall as well. Uh, I've, I've touched upon the fact that it's re recognised by building control warranty providers and financial institutions. So we have examples of it being um, of warranties being provided. Uh, NHBC uh, recognise it through the BBA certificates. Uh, we've had um, uh, warranties issued through LABC, through Premier Guarantee, through Build Store, through Global Home Warranties. There's, there's, there's a whole variety of them out there that are available. They all have their own criteria. So again, we would sort of talk to you before you embark on a project about who you want to use, who is a local building control officer, and, um, and what do they want to see, and, and how we can help you uh, work through the project so that by the time you get to build with it, um, all of these things are taken care of in the background. So really, that's uh, that's the whole shooting match. Uh, that was um, probably longer than I took on the uh, introductory webinar, uh, but there was a bit more information in there about um, what would be uh, applicable to, to commercial contractors and and really focusing more on compliance and more on cost savings. Hopefully that's piqued your interest and it's given you a bit of information, at least as a starter for 10 on, on Duracell and ICF as a concept. Uh, my details are there, or you can certainly get hold of me through the inquiries um, at duracelluk.com uh, or LinkedIn as well. If you, if you go on there, then uh, um, you, you'll find me on there and we can, we can help you with any questions that you may have. I hope that's useful and um, I shall leave that with you.